Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Privileged to be your host, this is Dan Moore. Well, welcome back to the Action Catalyst. This is Dan Moore, your host in Nashville, Tennessee. And today we have something extremely special. We're going to be spending time with American conductor Roger Nirenberg. I'm going to share with you a bit of his background as a conductor, but what's I think most current and most relevant is that he is a creator of a program that he calls the Music Paradigm. And through that, he has been brought to the podium of the London Philharmonic, the Residenti Orchestra, the New Zealand Symphony, the National Symphony, and the Symphony Orchestras of Pittsburgh, Atlanta, and Baltimore. And with more than 100 orchestras around the world, he's collaborated with musicians to put this program together. I think the only way to truly describe it is that it is a learning experience. The use of symphonic music and the combination of talents of conductor and t- members of the orchestra to eliminate insights about people at work and about teams and how they work together. In this workshop, participants are seated amongst the orchestra musicians. And while they're learning and listening to the conductor, who is Roger, they get great insights into the opportunities, the challenges, and the communication issues faced in their own organizations. Over the last 20 years, hundreds of different organizations have benefited from this, from civic groups and nonprofits to Fortune 500 companies in some two dozen different countries. It's amazing because this is not the way Roger started out. He started out as a musical conductor and director with an auspicious debut at the Lincoln Center in New York with the Pro Art Chorale. He has played with the symphony orchestras of most of America's great cities and abroad has recorded with the London Philharmonic, the Shanghai Broadcasting Symphony Orchestra, the Czech Radio Orchestra, and other orchestra engagements in Mexico, Nova Scotia, and many, many places. And we're just very delighted that he's able to be with us today on the Action Catalyst. He's also the author of a book called Maestro, a surprising story about leading by listening. And we're going to learn some things about that today. So Roger, welcome to the Action Catalyst. Hi, Dan. Delighted to be here. Fantastic to have you here as well. Um, very, very curious. From a highly lauded conductor with a tremendous background in music to becoming a unique source of inspiration for leaders and members of organizations everywhere, what were some of the twists and turns that got you from that angle on the podium to the current one that you occupy? Well, maybe the most interesting thing is that I never intended for it to happen. Um, and I think there are many great things that happen that way that that you don't will them, but rather they kind of reveal themselves. When I was a music director, I became kind of painfully uh, aware of the fact that most people in our country don't really consider this music very important. They don't; it's not part of their lives. They don't get any any reward from it. They, then they're kind of afraid of it. Many of them, and uh, and it just became clear to me that this is a big problem. It was a problem for musicians and it was a problem for the people who, uh, who didn't, you know, didn't benefit and whose lives weren't enriched, enriched by this kind of music. And so I challenged myself to see if there was a way that I could create some kind of experience that would, that would help people to feel what I feel and what, what musicians feel. And that was what I was seeking. And that was how I designed this learning experience. But in the course of it, uh, what, what happened is kind of by accident, I discovered that this, this thing had, it had business value. And I wasn't anticipating that. But when I saw the opportunity, I thought, well, why not? Let's go with that. Wow. What was your very first time to implement this new program? In other words, it, it is a radical change from what you had been doing, even though it drew from the knowledge source. Not really, because, you know, I had been giving a lot of pre-concert talks and, and music appreciation type things. I considered that part of my responsibility as, as the music director of an orchestra. And I would frequently speak at performances. 
And there was somebody who was in my audience uh, in Connecticut who was the CEO of a, 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 an insurance company, and he said he wanted me to come and speak at his uh, meeting. So I said I'd be happy to do that, but I didn't. I, I wanted first to know what the meeting was about and what the context was. And so, um, so he gave me a long briefing about how they were changing their business model, how the model, the current model, was not going to be durable, and and they were not going to stay competitive unless they changed it. And and they were restructuring it. And after I listened to what they were they were trying to accomplish, I said, well, you want your salespeople to act like string quartet players. So let me bring a string quartet with me and let me do a demonstration. And that was the, the very first time that it happened. Um, and, and then I was telling another CEO who was on the board of my other orchestra about this. And he said, well, I want you to do this for my company, but I don't want a string quartet. I want the orchestra. And, and then I began to design what I was doing for, for him and what he was trying to accomplish. And it was from that success that it began to open my eyes to that this was, this was really something that was, was viable. It was something that, that answered what I was trying to do. I had no idea that ultimately it would kind of like uh, consume my conducting career. Uh, but I just, I followed the, my nose for, for opportunity in the same way I did when I was, when I was young. I was, I was a, a composer. That was what I wanted to be. And I knew what it was to, to feel inspiration and to, and to follow it and to go with it. And that's just exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you came from a position of great competence. And because of that competence, people felt the trust for you and you were able to make that transition. But I think it's remarkable. You saw the opportunity and you began to put more time, effort, resources into it. And to go from a string quartet to a full orchestra, that's a big jump. But I know you've worked with groups of all size. It's not really such a big jump. It's, it's just changing the media. For me, it was, very, it was very similar. In a way, all the things that I do feel very similar. But they draw from your base of experience and your really rapid mind and how well you adapt and adjust. Because I've seen you do that in person, adapting and adjusting to a group that didn't know you at all. Yes, right. For, for our listeners, many times when Roger comes to a city, he will recruit musicians that don't know what the music's going to be, that have never met him, that have never even played together before, and pulls them together instantly. It's not only many times, it's always. That's the business model. <laughs> That's the model. I think it's fantastic. Now, uh, many, of, many of our listeners um, are always wondering about mentors and guides that our guests have had. Have there been some very significant people that really helped shape you as you moved into what you're doing today? Too many to, to even figure out where to start. I mean, there, there were, you know, I don't think I, I have like a mentor the way many people do. Not a single one who really looked after me and believed in me and took care of me. But there are many people that I learned from, many. And there are many musicians, of course, but also people in the business world who, who mentored me. And as, as one of our guests said before, you can have a virtual mentor just by having your ears open and your eyes open and learning from what people post and things they write and things they say. And reading a, book. reading a book is like having a mentor. Well, it is. In fact, I'd like to, to shift just for a minute. And can you share a little bit about your book, Maestro, and the, the premise there? We'd love for our listeners to know more about that. Well, right away when I started doing the music paradigm, people began to ask me, have I written about this? And I hadn't. I didn't know how to write about it. And then I got a call from a literary agent who said that he had been on vacation in Turkey but had seen a television program about me in there. And he asked me if I wanted to write a book. And uh, I thought about it and I said, sure. And that began a long odyssey. Uh, it took me 10 years to write my book wow. and many, many twists and turns because it was not an easy book to write. It was so much about music and yet I couldn't play music. And, um, and after about five years or so, uh, I completely shifted, and, and there was a, a wonderful uh, 
uh, kind of ghostwriter who the, the uh, literary agent had connected me with. And we just both agreed that it wasn't working that way, uh, that what I was trying to do was sort of so unique that he just couldn't capture it. And, and then I devised the scheme for doing it, um, for how to write the book. And so it, it turns to be, like you said, a, a story. It's a parable about a, a business leader who gets promoted into a much higher position. And he's been so successful in his career, but he discovers on this higher level with people, all of whom know much more about what they do than he does, his leadership doesn't have any traction. And, and he's very confused. He doesn't know where to turn, but through circumstances, he end up, ends up having a symphony orchestra conductor as his mentor. And the book consists of many conversations between the executive and the, and the conductor. Um, and, and so he, his idea about leadership gets transformed during the course of the book. Well, I'm already sold. I'm anxious to get one. That sounds fantastic. And such a relevant story because people do get promoted and feel out of their depth and feel surrounded by people that are technically more proficient than they are, but it's the leadership skills that make that work. And it's hard to find, it's hard to find somebody to teach you leadership. First of all, most people don't really think about it, and they don't really understand when they're effective, why they're effective, and more especially, when they're not effective, why it's not working. So for a lot of people, it's kind of trial and error. But I've, I've been fortunate maybe to, to have had the, uh, the impetus to really think about it. Because as a conductor, you get a lot of feedback instantaneously. All of your workforce is constantly in front of you. And so you see the effect of your, of your leadership in real time all the time. And you have lots of opportunities to contemplate, why did that not work? Mm -hmm. Or why did that work so well? So it took me a long time to arrive at the ideas that I have now. But now I find that they work very well. I know that's absolutely true. Now, speaking of having your, your people you're leading directly in front of you, obviously as a conductor, that's true. They're all looking at you. The audience only sees your back. Invariably along the way, you've dealt with some very strong personalities, some, some headstrong people, as talented people often are. Any basic ideas or tips on, on dealing with people whose, whose egos maybe are enlarged, shall we say, and keeping them as part of the team? Yeah. Well, in a certain way, the people who have real big egos are really a pain to deal with. But I think the conductor has to, has to get to a place where you consider those egos a real asset. I mean, you want people who believe in themselves. You want people who have strong ideas. The challenge is, how do you get those various different personalities working together? How do you get them to, to uh, buy into what the whole thing is about and understand that, that, it's the, uh, that they play an important role, a really vital role in that? But if you can get everybody to buy into the, the big picture, um, and you do that effectively, the egos tend to then, they dissolve into performing the task. Mm -hmm. I've seen that a lot. So emphasizing their vital role, but also how being part of the whole is going to become even more effective and more powerful and more gratifying. Well, the way, the way I work with orchestras now and the way I, I, I think about leadership is I try as much as possible to make, make it about the collaboration between the various elements of, of, of the organization that I'm working with. And it's not so much about me, but it's more about them. And I'm an agent of helping them to collaborate by, by making clear where are the, where are the uh, useful relationships, where and you know how to help people to expand their circle of awareness, to take in things that are going on that they hadn't quite considered important yet. Um, once they do that, then 
the collaboration is a lot easier. But when, when the conductor or the leader feels that it's that his or her job to tell people what to do in order to make it right, that's when you have clash of egos. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to be told what to do. But to, to, but to, to, be, to be told like where there's fruitful collaboration and how to, how to make that relationship richer within the group, I find most people are really interested in that. Mm -hmm. I like that. That takes all the focus out of a conflict, potential conflict between the conductor and the talented person and gets That's them focused right. on exactly. opportunity. If you have a conflict with the talented person, you've lost. The conductor has lost. Even if you win the conflict, you've still lost because you've changed the subject from the work itself into the personalities and the power. And people love power struggles. They, you know, they're, everybody's willing to have an argument all the time. You know, it was when somebody I know who said, I always have time for an argument. No matter how busy I am, I always <laughs> have time. For so you don't want to get into that. And, and, and you stay away from it by, by just focusing on who collaborates with whom and, and then have them work together. With, and it doesn't have anything to do with you. It, it's, it's them. And when I rehearse an orchestra, I, I will frequently ask them, one of them to lead the ensemble uh, and start them off. And so this, this kind of collaboration within the group begins to develop. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic insight, Roger. I'm making notes so I can apply that myself today. <laughs> and yeah. I appreciate that. Um, somewhere along the way, you're bound to have encountered some, some brick walls where suddenly obstacles toward your progress have just emerged from nowhere. You can't see around them, over them. What, what have been some coping strategies or effective ways that you've done when you hit this just unexpected setback, rug dragged out from under you, podium knocked away? What, what, yeah. What's worked? Well, I, you know, I think that what you're talking about is an inevitable part of life. I think it happens to everybody. And so the first thing is when, when you, you, you're knocked off your feet, you know, to not feel like this is the end of the world. This is part of the process of, of, of making something good. There's, there are always setbacks. Uh, and then to understand that it, may, it will likely take time to absorb lessons from a setback. And to allow yourself that time and allow yourself the space to be curious. And what I'm looking for always is what, what blind spot did I have? What lack of awareness, what lack of skills did I have that contributed to that particular thing? Because a lot of times it seems as though that setback, you know, comes from nowhere and just knocks you over. But actually, you, one has a role in it that you were just, the way you acted, what you knew and what you didn't know was part of what brought you that setback. And so a setback is a fantastic opportunity to, to learn in a big way. And I try as much as possible to maintain that attitude. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you use the word curiosity. You know, give yourself time to absorb the lessons, and instead of being fully demoralized, try to get curious where you can figure out what part did I play in this? What were the blind spots that I might have had that I was right. unaware of? And the question is, first of all, the first thing that you want to be curious about is what happened? Because <laughs> That's true. That seems as though it's an obvious thing. Then you look at it and you try to re remember, play it back in your mind, and you play it back in slow motion, you know, and what happened first and what happened next and what happened then and how did this come about? So the first thing is what happened? And the second thing is what role did I play in that? Uh, did I play a role? What role did I play? And what were the choices that I made that contributed to that? Uh, I get very curious about that. Uh, and then I, I try to find, well, what can I learn from this? I love that. Because if we can replace 
the sense of demoralization and defeat with curiosity and self-evaluation, then we can move forward. That's what I'm hearing you say. It's fantastic. And it's so human. You know, when you have a big setback, if it's a real big one, and I think everybody has big setbacks in their life, but when you have a, a, a big setback, it just feels like you're the only one in the world who ever had one. And, <laughs> and it feels, you know, there's so much shame that you can feel. And, and, you know, but actually, the reality is that this is, this is part of life. Uh, and most people, I think, in their careers at one point or another will get fired. When, when you begin, you don't think that'll ever happen. But, but that's a normal part of a, a career, and it happens to many, many people. And so, first of all, you don't get, you don't get so demoralized about it. It's just a big learning opportunity. What, what keeps you striving and growing, Roger, rather than just resting on your laurels and coasting? Because you're, you're constantly growing and trying new things and traveling endlessly yeah. and promoting, and, and you, you're, you're really going for it. Well, you know, I don't have, I don't have an easy answer for that. I just, it, it, it dawned on me recently that, that I'm, I'm not the slightest bit cynical. And, uh, and I'm absolutely in, as engaged as I've ever been in anything in the work that I'm doing now. Um, and if somebody asks, well, what's your secret or something, I don't think there is a secret. I, I don't know. I think that I'm very interested in, in growth. I'm interested in, in promoting people's growth, and I'm interested in my own growth. And I see, I look for opportunities to grow, and they're abundant. They're abundant everywhere. Uh, every street that I walk in in New York, there's an opportunity for me to grow in some way. And uh, I just stay alert for that. And, um, and that's a good attitude, I think. In any case, that's the attitude that I've, I've come up with. I think it's a fantastic attitude. When you stay alert for opportunities, that's so much better than just being head down, not even thinking about what's going on around you. And the interesting thing is to, when you find opportunities in the place that you would least expect it, mm -hmm. that's really, that's a, a great blessing. You know, like you go into a, 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 I don't know, a McDonald's or something, and then, and then you, you, you learn something from the person behind the counter. Uh, that's when I feel like, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that I, I really, I'm nourished by. And that definitely feeds your commitment to stay growing because you see those opportunities and they nurture that. I think it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, here's kind of a, of, of a different question. Do you have a morning regimen, a way you start your day to get your brain fired up, to get yourself in a productive mode? Is there any particular habit pattern you wouldn't mind sharing? I, I do. I don't consider it important at all. But uh, generally, I have a cup of coffee in the morning. And I like to do a crossword puzzle in the morning. Um, I find it relaxing, and I find it absorbing, and um, and I, I try, most often I, I make the time to do that. Um, other than that, that's one of the few routines in my entire day. Mm -hmm. I don't have much routine in my life at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and every day is free form. Um, and, but that every day tends to have a crossword puzzle and, um, and a cup of coffee. And that could get your day centered. Not to mention the fact they say crosswords are one of the best ways to keep mental acuity growing and uh, to never lose that. Well, if you want to keep mental acuity growing big time, then study a musical instrument and study it as an adult mm -hmm. because that is really challenging. Um, and I do that. Um, and I think that, you know, 
really the ideal time for learning a musical instrument is your childhood when you you're not aware of things and you do so many things intuitively and uh and then at a certain point comes the age of reason where you begin to ask yourself how and why and then and then that kind of learning is no longer possible but when you're an adult and and you know like what it is to succeed and what it is to fail and you have expectations and all that uh it's a whole different challenge it's a it's a fascinating challenge to to take control of your, your mind and your body become your own teacher it i think it really keeps you young i'm going to share this right after we finish with a friend who's retiring in three months at the age of 68 and he told me two days ago i've always wanted to learn to play the piano do you think i still can and i think i can share this with him the answer is yes but it's it's very challenging and it it requires the development of enormous patience and a kind of a, a an attitude of kindness towards oneself kindness in the face of frustration and failure because when you take up an instrument there's going to be a lot of frustration and there are many things that you will try to do on a daily basis that you will fail in. and how do you stay kind and sympathetic while at the same time having your full critical faculty available that's that's a, an opportunity for enormous growth mm -hmm. and having and a, of the mind of the mind and having a sense of humor about those mistakes and failures which you can't avoid yeah yeah it's crazy because Franz Liszt said there's only seven white keys and five black keys. What can be so hard about it? <laughs> there's a lot that's hard about it. Well, I think that it makes sense that Liszt would say that. <laughs> Very true. It, um, wasn't, it wasn't hard at all. Roger, your work has been an encouragement to, to so many people, both as a conductor and with your leadership. How would you encourage an individual who feels like, like their life has become all flats, no sharps, There's, they're really down. They're not sure where to turn. Uh, any sort of steps or values you might impart? Well, that's a really interesting question. It's an important one. I think I would say, look at, think about, moments when you felt whole, where you felt really good, where you felt enthusiastic, where you felt inspired. Some people have difficulty locating those moments. Then go back further. Go back further into your childhood. Go back to some point when you felt ecstatic when you felt free, when you felt powerful, when you felt, you just really felt good. And stay there a little while in that memory. And, and then, you know, think about well, what, what characterized that kind of feeling. Uh, and then, is there, any shred of that that you see anywhere in the world or that you experience in your life and go there trust your inspiration your inspiration is a it's a kind of an indicator it's an indicator of what you should be doing. And so I would say, spend time and, and, and effort on that. It will be a long journey to where you fill your life with that feeling. And it requires a lot of patience and a lot of confidence. But, but I think the inspiration is, is a good starting point. And then, of course, you want to fill your life with the right people. 
You want to see who the people are who are bringing you down and just spend as little time with them as you can. You may not be able to eliminate them, but don't spend your time with them. Find the people who bring you up. Find the people who, who, uh, who are that kind of influence. And there are those people that are actually in your life, and then there are the people that you can meet by reading them. Or, you know, there's so much on, on YouTube. There's so many great things on YouTube. People, you know, giving talks, and there's just there's such an education you never have to leave your, your desk in order to explore the world. It's, it's a really an amazing time that we live in. And uh, I'm constantly amazed by it. That is a fantastic set of steps. Exactly what we were hoping for. Roger, time with you flies. It goes so quickly. Uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of our listeners. About five minutes, haven't we? I think about five, yeah. Something like that. We're barely into the first movement. That's what it feels like. How can people locate your book, Maestro? Well, that's easy. It's, it's sold wherever books are sold, you know, online. There's, you know, Barnes & Noble and uh, Amazon and, and uh, CEO Read, uh, wherever, wherever books are sold, it's available. And to contact me, it's through my website, which is musicparadigm.com. And there's a, a contact, uh, uh, a link to make a contact, and you can write to me. And... Um, and there are also blogs and videos and interesting things on that, uh, on that website. Good. Well, I'll look forward to spending time on there myself. Let me just say thank you on behalf of all of our audience for sharing and, and for being such a significant force for good. We do value and appreciate all you do. Well, thank you very much. I had a lot of fun talking to you. We did too. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Take care. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening. This episode is sponsored by Southwestern Coaching. Southwestern Coaching has helped over 12,000 people increase their incomes by over 25% on average. As a successful salesperson, you know the importance of increasing your sales, but sometimes you might just need a little extra push and accountability to meet your goals and grow your business. Southwestern Coaching will help you increase your income through one-on-one -on -one sales and leadership coaching tailored specifically to your needs. Together, we will elevate sales. To schedule your free one-on-one -on -one business action planning session with a Southwestern Coach, Go to www.southwesternconsulting.com forward slash action catalyst.